That's good. All right, hi everyone. Uh, so my name is Elizabeth Joseph. I'm here to talk to you a bit about mainframes. Uh, so first off, who has used a mainframe before? Who knows what a mainframe is, like seriously? Okay. <laughs> um, so, as I said, my name's Elizabeth Joseph. Um, I've been to LSCA like five times. My first one was in Perth. Um, and I've given a lot of talks about open source software in communities, continuous integration. Um, I worked on the OpenStack project for some time. I did a lot of volunteer work with Debian and Ubuntu for several years. Um, and then most recently I was working for Mesosphere, uh, working on Apache, Mesos, and DCOS. So my background is fully open source. Um, through most of this, I've been, I was doing systems administration, so I've been doing systems administration for about 20 years. Um, so about a year ago, I found myself looking for a new job, and IBM came up and they said, hey, you know a lot about Linux. Do you want to work on mainframes? And I said, no. <laughs> Why would I want to do that? <laughs> um, but over the course of a few weeks, um, I spoke to some of the VPs and the engineers, um, and I, I kind of came around. Um, and that's pretty much what I'm here to talk to you all about, um, because even coming from a really strong open source background, not knowing anything about a mainframe, I couldn't tell you what they were a year ago. Um, it's been a really interesting journey for me to figure out what they are um, and where they are sort of in the ecosystem um, of Linux systems administration um, and generally the world. So I'll answer this question first. Um, so what is a mainframe? Um, if you look at this uh, IBM System 360, this is kind of what I had in my head when I thought about mainframes. They're old and all the ones that exist in the world are old <laughs> and um, they're really big. Um, it turns out uh, IBM releases a new one like every two years. Um, they do lots of innovation on the hardware and the software, um, both proprietary and open source sides. Um, so we just had a new release um, of a mainframe um, back in September, and that's the Z, Z15. Um, the one here in this picture, it's shown in a data center. Um, it's uh, they mainframe these days, they fit into a 19 inch rack. Um, the latest one can go up to like four um, four spots, so it just fits in like, you know, four spots in, in a regular data center. Um, it plugs into all the standard slots in your data center, so you don't need a special place for the mainframe anymore. And that was really interesting to me because I've worked in a lot of data centers, and it was always weird to see a mainframe off in the corner in its own special space. Um, it turns out it's not actually a big deal, um, but it is like conceptually a big deal for administrators. Like, I don't have a place to put this, or it looks weird where it is. Um, but what is it? So depending on who you ask, um, there's lots of different answers as to what a mainframe is. Um, traditionally, they run ZOS, um, but a lot of the new customers who are joining the mainframe fold are running Linux on them. Um, they're really, really good at data processing and encryption, and that's kind of where they shine. Um, what I like to tell people is if you're just running a few web servers and apps, you don't need a mainframe. If you're doing a lot of data processing and want a lot of privacy and doing encryption, you should probably start looking at them. Um, because compared to giant cloud bills, um, they're actually getting to be competitive again. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a bit more about each one of these things, but like enterprise grade storage, virtualization technology that goes back decades, um, networking. Um, but the last point on this slide is the important one. Uh, mainframes are a different architecture. Um, they're not x86. Um, they're what we call Z architecture or S390X. So if you ever see an open source project um, like Kubernetes, um, if you see S390X as one of the build options, that means they're building for the mainframe architecture. This is what they look like inside, and it took me months to get this picture after I joined IBM. Like I joined eight months ago, and I was like, but what is inside? <laughs> And they were like, nobody cares. I was like, nerds care. <laughs> I care. This is, so I, I tweeted this, and everyone's like, oh, that's what's inside. I'm like, yeah, it's cool. Um, so if you can read this, they've got like the, the Ethernet switches up at the top, um, the uh, power, that's the, the PDUs. Um, they come in air-cooled and water-cooled. Um, support elements, that's how you interact with the mainframe. So that's like, um, some of them have like a, a ThinkPad like attached to the mainframe. Otherwise they go to an external um, configuration machine. Um, and then all these things that say IO, those are all your PCIe cards. So some of those do like um, the, the storage interactions, some of them do cryptography. There's like all kinds of cards that you can put in these machines. And obviously this is like the four frame model. So like this is one that's totally decked out. Um, so if you notice, I didn't mention storage. 
um, because storage is not in this machine typically. Um, there are a few empty spaces, so you could stick some storage in here if you wanted to. Um, but typically, did I have a slide for that? Okay, maybe I do later. But storage is like a separate box. So stepping back, so that's what a mainframe is. Um, mainframes are super popular in the 90s, but one of the things I learned recently was that more mainframes are sold in this past decade than they were in the 1990s. So there's still a ton of mainframes out there. Um, but going back to when I started doing systems administration about 20 years ago, um, I grew up in the age of Google telling us that we should all just use x86 hardware. It's cheap, you can replace it, you can run all sorts of open source software on it, and that was super appealing to me. And I'm like, that's awesome. Um, and that, that was appealing for a lot of organizations. And we sort of all bought into this wholesale for my entire career. I didn't even look at enterprise grade hardware. Um, I didn't really know it existed. Again, like I didn't know what a mainframe was. Um, but it turns out, um, after working on Ubuntu and OpenStack and Kubernetes, that stuff is really, really hard. Um, doing a really solid distributed system requires really, really smart engineers, um, a really strong management structure to hold them all together, um, and distributed systems are hard. But that's what everyone thinks they should use now, so they end up hiring vendors and spending ridiculous amounts of money to cobble together these cheap x86 machines. Um, and that works great for a lot of companies, um, but what I am kind of here to say is like that's not the only option. Um, it's not right for everyone. Like, if you are using x86 hardware and it's working great for you, then that's awesome. Um, if you are struggling with uh, storage issues and networking issues and vendors who are trying to put together your new cluster and it's really not working, um, it may be that using all of that is not quite right for you. And sort of getting back to the open source aspect of it all, um, mainframes run Linux. Um, I mentioned ZOS but they also run Linux, um, and they have for about 20 years. So for a history lesson, <laughs> um, it was back in 1998 that some hobbyists got together and decided to run Linux on the mainframe because it's there. This is like put Linux on a dead badger era. <laughs> so it was there, it's cool. Um, and so like if you look at some, some of the early pioneers of, of running Linux on the mainframe, their reasons for doing it are like, it's fun, it's cool, <laughs> it's there. And then like down towards the bottom of the list, they're like, it's actually a really powerful machine, it'd be cool to run Linux on it, right? But like the first reasons are like, that's really why you did it. You didn't do it to make money, you did it because it, you thought it would be fun. So this is 1998. This group came out with like the Bigfoot project, which was Linux on the mainframe. And IBM said, oh, we've actually been working on that. You totally scooped us. <laughs> so IBM came out about a year later in, on, it was actually uh, December of 1999, with the first patches to the Linux 2.2 kernel for S390X. So IBM came along and said, actually, we're working on this, and you can now run it on the kernel. At the time, it wasn't mainlined, so it was just patches that you add to the kernel on your own. Um, but these, di these days, all of the S390 stuff is built into the Linux kernel, so it's not anything special from IBM or anything. It's all built in. Um, and so over these 20 years, um, more and more software has been ported um, to the architecture. And in 2015, IBM came out with a Linux-only mainframe. So this one cannot physically run ZOS or any of the older operating systems. Um, it comes with something called IFL, which is a processor. It's the integrated facility for Linux. Um, so that only runs Linux. Um, so you can't even try to install anything else on it. So that was 2015, so we had the first Linux one and then another iteration, and they were super cute because they were named after penguins. <laughs> um, and I, I talked to one of my colleagues recently, and the, the, the names of, the, of the, the mainframes were the Rock Hopper and the Emperor. And one of my colleagues said, I always get them mixed up. And I said, well, it's easy because the Rock Hopper is the little one and the Emperor is the big one. And he said, Liz, not everyone knows about penguins. <laughs> so, Rock Hopper and Emperor. Emperor's obviously the big one. Um, anyway, with the, the release in 2019, we got rid of those cute names, much to my sadness. Um, and we only have one now, so this is the one. Again, you can get it in like one, fr one frame or to expand out to the four, like is in this picture. So this was a huge investment. Um, 
from IBM into the Linux ecosystem um, because now they're not even offering their old proprietary operating system on this specific machine. Um, it's all Linux. Um, and these are really cool to bring to conferences because they say Linux won on them and everyone wants selfies with them. <laughs> so one of the first questions I had um, when I joined IBM was what does it mean that you run Linux on it? Um, it is a different architecture so that means all of the software has to be ported over to the architecture. You have to recompile everything for it. So when we say like our official distributions are Red Hat, SUSE, and Ubuntu, what does that mean? Does that mean everything in the software repository has been ported and works really, really well? Um, no. <laughs> Um, it means a n huge chunk of the repository has been ported, um, and IBM works really closely with these vendors um, to make more and more software ported. So the first thing I did when I got my first VM on a mainframe um, was I tried to install Screen and IRC because I wanted to get on IRC and show everyone the proxy PU info, right? Um, and those worked. So there's lots of little applications that have been ported and it's really easy to port. I can't imagine a customer asked for a text-based uh, text -based chat client screen they might have asked for. Um, but a lot of this stuff is being ported. So this is kind of like our big, like shiny slide of all the important software that we've ported. Um, so IBM has a porting team inside the company and then we also work um, with the big distributions and also big software projects. Um, so part of what I do now is I work with individual open source projects to get them access to mainframe virtual machines. Um, we have one that anyone can have access to for 120 days, and then we offer VMs that stand up forever to put into their CI systems. Um, so a few of these, of these organizations, are, are open source projects, are using our infrastructure. And then we keep adding more um, as more like, hey, we want to build for ARM, and we want to build for power, and we want to build for the mainframe. Um, and then part of my job is also working with everyone else on my team to teach them about Linux, because they're all mainframe people, and I'm the only one on my team who is hired externally. Um, so I help them figure out how to run their Docker containers and figure out package management and stuff. Um, and of course, this is not an inclusive list. Um, we have, there's a, there's a bigger open, I think if you search for Linux on Z or Linux mainframe open source list, you can get a full list of everything that's been ported. Um, but the team releases a report every year, or every, every month, about everything they've updated and every, all the new releases of open source software that they've been porting. Um, and I mentioned Kubernetes earlier. Um, I spoke at KubeCon a couple months ago because we're running Kubernetes on the mainframe too, which sounds totally crazy <laughs> because it's a distributed system and you're running it on like the actual definition of a monolith. Um, but it turns out um, it's really, it's used for really, um, for the hybrid cloud infrastructure. So if people want to run the same infrastructure everywhere, they can run Kubernetes on the cloud or on the mainframe or whatever, and it's all the same tooling. So some of the things that make this pretty cool, and I was really impressed with since joining. So first is the enterprise grade storage. Um, this is just an example of some of these rack mount storage systems. Also the, the DS8900F. Um, this is a giant machine full of flash drives that has six petabytes of storage, which is pretty awesome. <laughs> um, and it's crazy fast because it's all flash drives. It's also really expensive, but I don't know how expensive. <laughs> um, but that's like this, the coolest, like a most amazing, amazing one. Yeah, that's a lot of storage. Um, but then some of these, some of these can actually fit into the mainframe. Some of them are just rack mount on the side. And one of the things that I found about enterprise storage that was interesting to me is I, I worked in OpenStack. And so I've been around the Ceph community and I've been around the Swift community and I've been in a lot of their sessions where they're trying to figure out problems they're having with distributed storage. And they have interesting problems about um, making sure there's data consistency and latency and all kinds of storage problems um, that they're trying to solve. So when I started learning about the mainframe, I kept bumping into these white papers written in the 80s by IBM and related companies. And sometimes the problems were the same exact problems that these distributed systems were running into. So I was like, okay, so the technology that goes into these, which is often Linux, like the, the DS8900 runs Linux secretly. <laughs> um, 
like all, all the technologies that they built to make these storage arrays work really, really well. A lot of the problems were solved in the 80s that the open source projects are now solving again. So I kind of want to go back in time and tell them all to read these white papers because <laughs> they're all public and they're really, really good. Um, but the enterprise grade storage is a big deal because I've run production Ceph clusters and sometimes I had bad days. Um, I never actually lost data, but it got close sometimes where, I mean, I wasn't working at companies that were like, we weren't storage companies, we just had stuff in storage. Um, and I think a lot of us sort of forget um, that these kind of black boxes just exist. Like, if you don't want to deal with it and you're okay moving away from the open source solution, um, which I probably wouldn't have been a few years ago, <laughs> um, but I'm, I've grown older and more practical these days. So I'm like, you know, if I really just want a storage solution, like these are there um, and these work with the mainframe. Um, another thing that I've, I've been really geeking out about um, with the mainframe stuff is all of the hardware based encryption. Um, so x86 totally has hardware crypto stuff inside of it now. Um, there was actually a vulnerability a few weeks ago that our sales guys loved because <laughs> they were like, haha, x86 is broken with crypto. Guys. <laughs> um, but, but seriously, um, so there's the hardware encryption. So if you look at this, this picture here, so like that, that's a mainframe, that's the two frame model. There's the, the CPC drawer, which is the processor drawer. So that has all of the processors and heat sinks and all kinds of stuff in it. And on each processor, um, there is a crypto coprocessor. So on the central processor, you can do all of your, a bunch of cryptography stuff. And then in those PCIe drawers that I mentioned, you also have these crypto express cards. Um, so that is an HSM. And then also, it also adds some extra crypto stuff in there. Um, so you don't have take away from any of your general processing stuff when you add encryption into the system, um, which means it's all just done for you magically. And if you're running Linux, it doesn't actually require any like IBM special sauce in the software side. Um, so for like the, the hard drive encryption, it's just using DMcrypt. Um, it's also using like OpenSSL and LibCrypto. And that was one of the cool things for me. I was reading one of the IBM resources about this. And like if you want to enable SSL to use the hardware crypto, it's like just a config file. It's not some like binary blob from IBM or anything. It's just open source and it's just built into it because uh, the community has added the support for S390X. Um, you also, it also just uses IPsec. And again, like this is all going to the hardware crypto stuff. Um, inside of Java and Go, you can also leverage the encryption, which is one of my favorite stories because Go has encryption in, in the language. Like you can write your programs and use encryption. And for S390X, it actually means Go with encryption runs faster on the mainframe than it does on x86, which is pretty cool because most of our porting efforts are just make it run as good as on, as on x86. Um, and then there's also um, an open source um, crypto library um, specifically for these chipsets. Um, <laughs> Virtualization's been around for a really long time. Um, so this was like probably the most fun I had when I was looking in, into the history of sort of the mainframe stuff. So in 1959 were the first time sharing papers. Um, and then a couple years later at MIT, they did their first demos um, on the IBM 709 of actual time sharing. And sort of time sharing is kind of the great grandfather of, of virtualization. Um, in 1972, um, the S, 370 mainframe came out, and that came out with a VM370, which was a terrible virtualization technology. <laughs> but it existed, and it was the first real virtual machines um, in the world. Um, and there's, it's kind of funny because IBM really didn't see a future. This was almost all community driven. The community, like universities and companies, they were like, we want virtualization. We want workloads running concurrently. And IBM's like, eh, I don't think people need that. Um, Thankfully, they came around in the 80s. Um, virtualization really took off on the mainframes. And then in, it was, I think, probably a decade ago, um, actually 20 years ago, ZVM came out, which is kind of like the best in class for the mainframe virtual virtualization. Um, and today, KVM is supported as like a first class citizen on the mainframe. And so you can use all of your KVM tooling now. So it's really easy to use OpenStack, for instance, to launch VMs on the mainframe um, because it just hooks into libvirt and does its thing. So it can be integrated into the rest of your um, organization, like your infrastructure. Um, 
the other interesting thing about this is they've solved a lot of interesting virtualization pro problems. Um, so when I was working on Apache Mesos, we'd sometimes get stuck in networking issues. Um, but since the VMs on the mainframe are like all together and they're communicating over buses and things, like networking is a lot less of a concern. Um, so some of the virtualization concerns that you run into um, in typ typical distributed deployments these days, you don't run into um, when you're running it on one of these guys. And the other reason you might want to care about it is the mainframe community is the only one that, the only community I'm part of that regularly has obituaries, which is really sad. <laughs> um, but the truth is um, a lot of the mainframers are like, my, my uncle used to work on mainframes and he's retired. So a lot of the people who are working on mainframes, they are retiring and they're older. Um, and so we had this like 20 year gap where no one is being trained in mainframes. Um, I'll show you real quick at the end some of the things we're doing now to train new people. Um, but first of all, there are a lot of jobs in mainframe right now. I can't actually share the name of any of our customers. I tried. But if you do job searches for mainframes, you'll find out in Australia all the banks and governments and things that are using mainframes. Um, so there's partially, there's the mainframe side of the job, and partially we're Linux experts and a lot of these companies are moving to Linux on the mainframe, at least partially. So as I said, like part of my job is just explaining to my colleagues like, here's how to run Docker, here's how to use a package manager on Linux. And this expertise is really valuable inside these mainframe organizations. And they pay pretty well. <laughs> um, and then if you are getting out of your like Linux comfort zone, one of the things I learned this year is that the mainframe stuff isn't that hard. Um, it's really hard to get used to the tooling because it's old <laughs> and it feels weird because like the interfaces are really clunky. Um, but once you, once you get over that, um, the actual writing of the code and like using JCL and even COBOL, like it's not that hard. Um, you can probably pick it up. So I wanted to pause real quick. Um, we're almost done here, but some of the things that are going on so you can get more training in this stuff. So I'm wearing this Master the Mainframe t-shirt. Um, that's a contest for students that goes on from September to December each year. So it's already over. Um, but there's also a learning framework that anyone can sign up for. Um, and that, that goes all year. And it sort of walks you through like the basics of learning the IBM Z side of things, so not Linux, because we already know Linux, it's fine. Um, but sort of getting yourself somewhat familiar with the mainframe side of things. Um, other resources I found to learn real quick, um, IBM Redbooks. These are like the biggest secret, I, didn't, I mean, public secret. <laughs> I didn't really know about them, but there's so much information in these like books that are written by IBMers and other partners to learn about the system. So there's one all about the Z15 hardware. Um, there's one about Linux security, and that's where I learned about like all the encryption stuff. Um, but these books are really great. Um, here in Australia, there is a company called Column 72, um, which actually developed a bachelor's of IT in mainframes. So you can now take a class and a whole like course in learning about mainframes, um, which I thought was pretty cool. And then uh, finally, one of the things that I've been working on is the Linux Foundation is one of the um, sponsors of the Open Mainframe Project. Um, which develops a bunch of open source software for the mainframe. So that's like where I spend almost all of my time these days is just working with all of the projects that they have. So some of them are for Linux, some of them are for ZOS, um, but it means that you can do a whole bunch of open source stuff. And then I'm like, this is my happy place. <laughs> um, and so it's not just this proprietary world anymore. So let's see. And that is where I wanted to conclude. So. In summary, mainframes still exist. There's lots of new ones, there's lots of jobs, and you should check them out because the hardware is super cool and it's not all proprietary anymore. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much, Elizabeth. Um, next up, we have uh, two short talks.